Good comeback. OK, it's just past 1.30, so we'll, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to How to Make Online Delivery Better Than Traditional TV, which looks at, in particular, at sports video online. We're in a general video stream media conference. Uh, this is particular to sport. Why sport? Uh, simply because the user is probably more engaged in watching sport than any other sector. Um, if you give high quality content to a sports fan, that sports fan is willing to pay two, four, six, eight, ten pounds a month or ten pounds per event to watch that content. And improvements mean more money. So if you can deliver one megabit per second to the end user, they might be willing to pay two pounds. Two megabits per second, you might get three pounds out of them. And that increase in money goes even further if you have data feeds which are included with the content, if you present it well, if you have betting opportunities associated with it, then again, you can get more money from the end user. So as Seb Co said in a, a slightly different context, there is an honesty to sport which allows company like, companies like us to extract more money from the, from the end user. I'm delighted to be joined by four companies that know a great deal about honesty. Uh, we have Perform, Streamworks, <coughs> Aqueduct, and Opta. From Perform, we have Howard Kitto, who is CTO and responsible for tech strategy. So sitting, sorry, I'll do that. I'll do that from the far side. From the far side, starting with Aqueduct, we have Simon Nixon. Uh, Aqueduct is a full-service digital agency. They have clients which include Sunderland, Man City, the FA, and the RFU. And Man City is probably recognised as the best football website. Uh, if you speak to people within football, you can, you can verify that. Simon Nixon leads all the major sporting clients for Aqueduct. Sitting next to him is Howard Kitto, CTO of Perform. Perform have got over 1,000 employees and 23 officers. They've got the world's largest portfolio of digital sports rights and an advertising network that delivers to 170 million sports fans. Uh, Simon Banub is with Opta. They're the leading sports data company and deliver more data than anybody else. They have 300 customers in 40 countries. And sitting next to Simon is Ray Mir from Streamworks, whose clients include AP, Reuters, and the UN. They have technology that saves up to 70% 70, 70 in bandwidth delivery uh, uh, bit rates. So the format's going to be a very short presentation of between five and six, seven minutes from each of the presenters, and then some questions from the audience, and that, that will take us to 45 minutes. So to start with, we have uh, Howard Kitto from Perform, and you, I don't know if you want to talk from there or, or from here. Uh, I'll still look, I'll see if I can get that in the demo tonight. Um, okay, so at Perform, um, we have a two-pronged two attack, really. Um, I'm not going to get this up to something wet. How do I do that? Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so um, Perform's grown very rapidly over the last um, few years, and we have a very large number of uh, different products and services that we offer. We have a whole range of um, direct-to-consumer things we do and lots and lots of business-to-business uh, -business, um, products as well. Um, in the context of this presentation today, I thought I'd focus on kind of our, our approach to how do you make sports engaging for mass markets. So the first thing that we try and do is we build great consumer experiences. So uh, there's a few examples of the different ways that we get our content in front of people. So we have uh, betting services here. Um, so this is Bet365, some tennis going on yesterday. Um, we have a uh, product I was actually going to show you in a moment here, which is something you can do online that you can't really do on TV, which makes it a very interactive live video services. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, um, as you just mentioned, that we're doing an awful lot with uh, sports data and making that uh, an intrinsic part of our services at the moment. So um, this is a visualization from uh, the uh, uh, Iran game yesterday. So uh, uh, this is stuff that we're working on uh, a great deal at the moment. And sort of marrying together video and data is a very important part of what we're working on. Um, so we have these, these customer experiences that we, we work on a lot. So we've got to work on every device and every platform, that kind of thing. Uh, and this is how we're going to get it in front of people. So we have our, 
a range of um, our own brands over here. So this lot here are the uh, consumer propositions that we have from sportingnews.com in the States, gold.com, Spox in Germany, Mash Colleague, biggest sports website in Turkey, um, uh, all these different kind of consumer, consume, direct consumer propositions that we have. And then we also work with rights holders, broadcasters, publishers, uh, anybody else. So basically the, the kind of uh, perform strategies to sort of spread our content very thin, very wide, a bit like margarine really. And sports content has very uh, ephemeral. It's here today and gone tomorrow. There is really very little value in the long term, in the long tail of it. So the uh, secret of getting maximum value out of it is to get it in as many different outlets as you possibly can. Um, so what might be quite cool is just to show you this, if it's working. Live demo is usually a bad idea, but we'll give it a try. Hang on. said a live demo is a bad idea here we go way okay so this is just an example so in response to how you uh, might make TV, uh, online experiences better than TV firstly I don't believe in that because obviously my 56 inch HD really lovely LG TV is just awesome and nothing's going to replace that but at least we can do things with online internet empowered experiences that are different anyway um, so this is um, some tennis going on live right now. Uh, this is a kind of thing that we like to do where we can kind of watch several things at once. Um, and uh, do cool things like that. You can have your kind of, uh, I don't think we have any stats for these tournaments actually, but uh, there's a sort of stats thing here where you can kind of watch the scores and that kind of thing. Um, kind of chat and that kind of stuff. So um, this, So this is kind of, uh, just an example of the kind of things you can do. And we have this sort of uh, running on all devices and that kind of stuff. So I um, thought it might be nice to show you that. Some live sport. There you go. It works. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all I really wanted to say. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, next up will be Simon Nixon from Aqueduct. Good afternoon, hope you enjoyed your lunch. We've got the unenviable sort of keeping you all happy and awake and entertained uh, to stop the post-lunch slumber setting in. Um, I'm Client Service Director at Aqueduct. Um, as Duncan explained, thank you, Duncan, for inviting me and for joining these fine chaps on the panel. Uh, I've been told to keep this to five to seven minutes, so I'm going to see if I can break the Guinness World Record for the amount of slides you can fit into six and a half minutes. Um, and I have a little timer in front of me, and I've used 30 seconds already, so... <coughs> I shall crack on. Um, we have a wide range of clients in sport at Aqueduct. The logos on the top row um, particularly attention because those are the organisations that ask us regularly for our insight into engagement. Um, the slide's also made up of strategic, creative, content and technical clients that we work with. And if anybody wants to ask me about any of those afterwards, I'd happily chat about it. Um, and I wanted to share a phenomena that I'm seeing in my own home. And, uh, of course, I'm not target audience, um, but I did wonder whether the family might be able to provide me some insight. So, be prepared. Here comes a selfie. That's us at the Olympic Park last summer. That's my family. Fairly traditional-looking uh, bunch. Um, the kids are 8 and 16, by the way. Um, probably a medium interest in sport, but probably a high interest in gadgets and technology, as you might expect, uh, with the job that I do. That's our TV room in our lounge at home. Um, there is nobody in it, as you could quite poignantly see. Uh, that BT box over there in the corner on top of the dresser has no signal coming to it. We have no TV subscription in our house. We do, however, have a TV license. Um, oh, and there's an Apple TV box plugged in over there as well. Uh, but we do have a TV license because of this. Um, so left to right, in true sporting fashion, back row first. Uh, Windows XP netbook, Samsung Chromebook, MacBook Pro, of which there are three iPad 1, iPad mini, there's a Lumia there running Windows, iPhone 4S and two iPhone 5s. This is how we consume sport in our house. This is how we consume television in our house. Um, it's convenient, uh, it's on demand, it can be in whichever room that we want. Uh, it's something that I notice every day from all members of the family. Um, these devices are very personal to us. This is where our most personal content lives. 
our photos, like the one you saw earlier, and our watching of television. That's why it's different to TV. Um, so, now for some thoughts on what we do at Aqueduct when we met the family. Um, I, given the knowledge of these chaps here, I'm not going to talk about uh, rights ownership. Um, there's some experts here in the room. What I'm going to talk about is the opportunity afforded to those that can create their own content and are free to manage it. Uh, owning content to license to third parties, overseas broadcasters, blogs, fan sites, etc., provides a valuable source of revenue to our clients, and this is the advice that we give out every day at Aqueduct to the businesses that choose to work with us. Broadcasters traditionally owned rights. That's the way it was. Now we're seeing governing bodies and sponsors and clubs all owning their own rights. I would say that the democratization of sports media has happened. The question is, what can we do about it? Well, in the UK, as uh, Duncan said, we work with City. Um, they produce great content and they understand the value of those rights. I think that's what sets them apart. Not necessarily that they've got the best website, but they understand the value of the rights that they own. Um, Tunnel Cam is world famous. Bench Cam on the final day of the season, Mancini's hands in and out the pockets was something to uh, marvel at. Samir Nasri's signing, Joe Hart's bicycle kick, the Harlem Shake, YouTube sensations. Um, Sunderland started this journey a year ago in a completely different place. They're working with Stream UK and Aqueduct um, and they're producing great behind the scenes footage. It's a loyal army of fans and they've extended that down into Africa through their shirt sponsorship. You'll have saw last season, new sponsor this season. And the video uh, created uh, by O2 uh, for Inside Line uh, is really taking advantage of the partnership that they have uh, between the RFU and the O2. They've produced unique, light-hearted content uh, and uh, it's through access to players. The platform, of course, was a major tournament which attracts naturally a, a large audience. Over in the US, uh, John Ray, our strategy director, is here today. He and I spent some time in America this year. Um, online TV is reaching people without the limitations of cable. It is a travesty if you are a Yankees fan living in California <coughs> that you cannot watch your team. Digital media puts that right and addresses that problem. Uh, South by Southwest, we heard a senior executive from CBS say that he saw online TV as a replacement screen to television, whereas Fox uh, said quite the opposite. And they're tr in introducing some very interesting second screen experiences. We went to the MLS head office, saw some groundbreaking new tablet and mobile products. They're fighting in the face of the NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, established sports in the US. And they're clearly having to do great work in order to compete with them. Um, and we're about to do some highly innovative work ourselves with an NHL team. Watch the space. Maybe next year I'll be able to tell you what it's all about. We do like to work with challenger brands. I think it's obvious from what I'm saying, but I'm just going to say it anyway. These are the places where investment in digital sport um, has been put by businesses. So what's happened so far this year? We saw an ad campaign by BT Sport like no other that I've ever seen. Um, I'd be surprised if any of you have missed Gareth Bale and Robin Van Persie, Joe Hart and Tuaragi, who are a multitude of advertising channels. You would have had to have been in a cave all summer if you've missed this. Uh, for anyone who can't read uh, that message at the top there, it does say BT Sport is free with BT Broadband. They're pushing their app uh, as both a first and second screen experience. Remarkable. That's what they talked about on stage out at, the, out at Stratford. And you might have missed uh, Tuaragi this week. If you, if you have uh, missed it, do a search. There's a great bit of content. He's holding out the Premiership Trophy in a strongman challenge. It's fun, it's interesting, and it's quite top gear. And we like that style of editorial at Aqueduct. Um, the Sun have purchased the digital rights to the Barclays Premier League highlights. Um, they'll be uh, already building this, well, they will be building this into already successful content. Um, that does say on me app some, which I thought was a particularly nice headline. Uh, John and I visited the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. I would, if anybody has a business trip through New York, call in and go and see an event. It is unbelievable. Uh, free Wi-Fi, replays from all angles, cameras all around the arena, um, interaction uh, with amazing LEDs, check into your seat uh, for services delivered to you. Importantly, the, Bar uh, the Barclays Center have not given away the rights to the content and the data by trying to save some short-term money in the investment of technology. They understand that a sound CRM, CRM strategy allows them to understand what fans are doing in their arena. And that's what they've held on to very wisely. Uh, Viclone, great app that we tried out there. 
uh, film anything from the app or your camera roll, easy to upload, especially on their fast Wi-Fi. It syncs, edits and stitches together all the footage it finds in that location and creates a movie montage. What does that mean for the Brooklyn Nets NBA team? 17,732 filmmakers at every game, all sharing their content socially, watching it on their phones. Um, oh, and this is happening, and I'd be surprised again if you missed this. This will create, um, I think, a unique interaction between two clubs on two different continents. Same branding, very clearly there is an association between the two, more so than we've probably ever seen before. Teams have always done partnerships, but never like this. Um, so I'm nearly done, and I have only overstayed my welcome by one minute. Sorry, Duncan. Maybe I borrowed some from, from Howard. Um, we are lucky enough to work with great clients who have the freedom to produce this content, as I've said. Uh, there was one idea we came up with a couple of seasons ago, which I'm just going to briefly show you. It happened the day after bonfire night, so there might be a clue there about what it is. Um, who out here I would not want to watch this, which, by the way, I can't see a broadcaster, uh, endorsing Balotelli. And I do apologize to Sega for borrowing their font, but um, I had to create that myself, unfortunately. Um, it was a fun concept that we came up with. It was a bit challenging. He couldn't be trusted to be the figurehead of uh, Man City's TV channel. Um, but you can imagine it would have been fun, and it would have been something that you would have consumed online. Thank you for your time. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this whistle-stop tour. This is us, and I'm in a running battle with our two directors for Twitter followers. So any, any followers today would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, next up, Simon Banu, Director of Marketing at Opta. I've taken a completely the opposite approach to Simon and actually followed Duncan's instructions to have fewer than two slides. Um, and I've only got one. So I'm going to talk to you about Opta first, just give you an introduction to what we do. We're very much on the periphery of the stuff you've been talking about here today. I think if I walked around the exhibitor's room there, I wouldn't understand what anybody was talking about, uh, but don't hold that against me. I don't speak in acronyms, so I feel a little bit out of place. Um, but uh, we're, the, we're the world's leading sports data company, so we collect data from live sport across the world. We're mainly known for football, but we also do what we do for football for rugby union, rugby league, and cricket, and at a lower level for other sports. So from every football game, in every major competition around the world, and some non-major ones we record live, what happens to the ball at any moment? So who passed it to who? Where that happened on the pitch with an XY coordinate? We give it a timestamp. Um, all of this adds up to between 1,600 and 2,000 different data points from every single game. So you add all those together, and it just ends up with a massive database of, of sports information. We sell this to broadcasters, to betting companies, to... Um, online media, to sponsors and brands, and to the professional game them so, to itself. So, um, so that's us. If you see uh, somebody on Sky Sports talking to you about data, telling you what's happened, it's likely that's come from us. We have live chat with all of the broadcasters as the game's going on, all of that kind of stuff. So um, in terms of uh, how that kind of helps us to make online sports better than broadcast, we don't necessarily think it does, at least not yet. Um, obviously, the, the distinction between what is online and what is broadcast is going to be completely destroyed in the next few years. Anyway, if I'm watching something on my smart TV on iPlayer, am I watching it online or am I watching it on broadcast? It's, it, it's a distinction that won't mean anything to, to, the nec to the next generation. What we believe at the moment is that data can very much add to the experience of watching sport online if you're using a second screen or actually from the supply that we give to the broadcasters. And I've, um, I've shamelessly ripped off a made-up word um, from, a, from a guy who used to work for Manchester City, some of you might know him, a guy called Richard Ayres, who calls it uh, datatainment. So what we believe data can do for online is change the information that you're getting. So it can change it from the very basic, because I've put up here, there's a, there's a slide, and that just says, Laurent Koscielny is booked. That's a data point from us. There'll be a foul and a yellow card, and there'll be loads of things that led up to that, but all you'll find out is that he got booked. It might have a number in there that tells you the amount of times he's been booked this season. So that's maybe three or four different data points given to you by the broadcaster. They don't want to clutter their screen, so they're not going to give you much more. What our stuff 
allows our clients to do, and we supply all these data feeds to a lot of very clever people, is to give much more data in the hands of the user. So that isn't Lauren Koshelny's touch map there on the Sky Sports app in the, in the top right, as you can see, but it's a touch map of, of somebody. So if you're watching that live game and you want to see how involved a particular player is, our data feeds are, are, are pushing that through at Sky, it goes into their app, and you can look at the player, find out exactly what he's been doing, how that compares and contrasts with the other people on the pitch. What it also allows you to do is, um, is I've put here from being talked at. All that stuff there that Gary Neville's pointing at is actually up to data, and we love Gary Neville, and he's brilliant. Um, but in the past, you've just been talked at by sports experts as a viewer who will tell you what's happening, tell you why it's important, tell you what you should be taking from it. What our data allows it to do in the, on the online space is allow you to join in that analysis and become pundits, become mini Gary Nevels of your own choice. What, what is here is uh, an app called 442 Stat Zone that we've done for iOS, um, and that is all of the shots from uh, West Brom against a certain team, uh, on target, off target, goals. You can do that by player, you can do that by team, you can compare and contrast. You can do this live as the match is going on using your iPhone, and then you can share that analysis via social media. Um, we, we, this app covers, covers all of the major leagues in Europe and all, all of the major competitions. The Euro 2012 version of it, the share screens that, that, that push down this app, so people clicking, um, clicking share, sharing it by Twitter, Facebook, email, the share screens during Euro 2012, which is four weeks on, were viewed a million times online. So th this just shows that somebody like 442 can, can get very good engagement and you can get da use data as another way that people can discuss stuff. And what all that leads to is, um, is sharing your experience of watching sport with a, with a larger group than the people who are sat in your front room, really. It used to be the case where you would either go to the pub or you even in very, very traditional circumstances, you would actually go to the match to watch a game. Um, and you would share that social experience of watching football, of, of commenting on football, of pretending you're the expert, of seeing what's going on with the people around you. Now you can do that backed up with data, backed up with stats, backed up with a lot of different content, which is, is a natural byproduct of the game online. And this is another one of our clients called Squawker. They do a very clever thing where um, they have contextual advertising. So uh, the data points in the feed can trigger ads. So if a goal goes in, the ads can talk about a goal. If, um, if it comes to 20 minutes, Domino's Pizza's put a thing saying, click here to order now and the food will be with you at half time. So some very, very clever stuff going on. So I wanted to kind of make the point that the stuff that we do at Opta is um, something that can help make an online experience together with TV, better than just TV on its own. In the future, all that might be actually overlaid on your TV screen or whatever, and you might be able to pick which layers of the game you want to watch, but at the moment, that's kind of how I see it working. Great. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, next up is Ray Mir, who is CEO of Streamworks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, uh, Simon, just one quick point. Our new uh, director of legal is a former director of legal at Sega, so maybe she'll uh, want to have a <laughs> chat with you about uh, the font, but hey, uh, all good. So, um, I wanted to actually focus in on one of our case studies. Um, uh, as I was introduced, we do, do a lot of work for uh, Reuters AP and, and the United Nations in a live environment. So that's really the focus on what it is that I'm coming from here live, because we do believe live is really the core of, 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 of lots of types of content, but certainly sports. It's the sort of be all and end all you've heard uh, people touch upon that earlier, and that's something that we as a business focus in on. So uh, I mean, using case study of, of, of World Rally Championship, something that we did uh, with them a couple of years back, and, and we give you some data points about it, just in terms of the approach, the pitch, what we ended up doing, and, and what they should have done. Because there's a sort of a mindset, conceptual thing that I want to talk about here, which is, you know, is sports accepting of the idea that online digital uh, is blowing away television? As an ex-channel head, I launched 
prior to BT Sport, the last sports pay-per-view channel here in the UK, Prime Time, which was a boxing sports pay-per-view channel, JV between uh, Northern Shell and Showtime. So from a television perspective, <coughs> very much understand what it is that sports is and live sports because live content drives revenue, full stop. Uh, uh, it was alluded to earlier uh, uh, by uh, uh, Perform just in terms of you know, the, 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 the shelf life of sports content. So let me just move into what it is that we do. So we solve the single biggest problem with live real-time content on the internet, and that's that ostensibly it doesn't work. A click-play philosophy globally in terms of a user experience in Rio versus Manchester versus Tokyo versus Moscow on different devices is one hell of a food chain that is not ubiquitous. And ultimately, that's why on television, the experience is click play, and you have a multi-billion dollar sports live industry on TV. If that translates or could translate into online digital, it's a game changer. It's as simple as that. Uh, and again, uh, a linear process suddenly, and you've heard people touch upon it, and I absolutely agree and encourage and would go even several steps further in terms of where we are currently in terms of sports content, different devices, and how a linear experience is just being broken uh, uh, r regularly. Nearly dropped a glass of water on the computer here. Uh, so why? Uh, I, I'm going to just really sort of uh, uh, go, go through, you know, what it is live's all about. Some of the stats are phenomenal. Uh, uh, we can sort of email this out to you, you know, if you, you give us the details. But ultimately what it is that we're talking about here is that live content on the internet is going through a 1,000% growth across the board, spearheaded by sports, no less, clearly, because of what Duncan mentioned at the start in terms of it's quantifiable. People pay money to watch live content, and we're at the midpoint of that. On demand has been exploding for years. We've heard what BC Sport are doing, using sports as a spearhead for broadband penetration and take-up. But that live aspect of sports is, 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 is growing exponentially, and there's, there's, there's a bunch of uh, stats that we're talking about here. What did we do uh, with World Rally. So we were approached by World Rally several years ago when they uh, went through a, 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 a change of ownership. Sister company to Formula One, uh, uh, run by the FIA, Jean Todd in, in, in Paris. So we wanted to use unique content, the WRC content, to, to create an environment that looks beyond convention conventional linear TV audiences. Switch the television on, there you go, multi-camera angles, it's the French Rally, and a commentator's talking at you. That's it. Wonderful television experience for you. Uh, we wanted to create habitual touch points beyond live content in terms of live uh, uh, rallies. What do you do when the rally's not rallying? Uh, what do those audiences do? Where do they go? Where do they sit? Where do they live? How does one engage with all of those? It's all about regular, consistent communication. This is all stuff that Perform Group do exceptionally well. Uh, leveraging that content to drive frequency and value using multiple digital assets because ultimately it's about fan engagement. So we, WRC fans are, are, are hungry for live instant content. Again, to reiterate what Opta were talking about here, data, datatainment, which is a word I've learned today and I'm going to use regularly from now on, is exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, and, and, and essentially pioneering a technology to enable live interest. Uh, WRC rallies allowing WRC to control, enrich, and respond to the viewer experience. What does that mean? I'm going to just uh, be very basic with you. I I it's driving two verticals. The reason why the live sports vertical on uh, uh, digital uh, internet-enabled devices is uh, superior to uh, uh, television is that it drives revenue and value. As an ex-channel head, all I cared about was my television content making more money. Lots of moving parts in that, but how can it generate more money? Different digital assets with engagement means a dialogue, and dialogue converts directly into revenue and value, full stop. These are just mock-ups that what we described to WRC, as I said, Perform Group, this is two years ago, Perform Group have really taken it to a completely different level uh, uh, in terms of a B2B. These were just mock-ups there. Now, did WRC take this? Of course they didn't. Uh, what they wanted to do is they said, here's a signal, you know, linear television, it's on a contribution feed, you pull it down, you encode it, that's what you do, isn't it, uh, and slap it up on a website. So we sat there and we said, okay, that's totally fine. You know, this is the landscape we described for you, and, and, and this is, you know, simplistic, but ultimately you've got WRC.com, and it's the center point of a constellation of revenue generating touch points, whether it's mobile, what's going on in the service park, social fan zones, the radio, it just goes all round and round. Again, beyond just the rally four day event, 
what do you do with that vast audience off rally and how one can monetize that. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. What we managed to convince the FIA to do uh, with the French rally as well as the Spanish rally was allow us to do a bit of data capture. And we're going to share that data capture with you just in terms of what they're missing out on. And this is two years ago. So we've done events since that these stats get blown away by. But this is just, you know, we, we created a token free-to-air model, but you had to answer a questionnaire. What are we talking about here? Uh, th who is the fan? Males aged between 18 to 44, 60% under, si under 35, 63% 60, are in employment, 17% in education, relatively affluent, strongly engaged with the WRC for more than five years. Almost nine in ten see the WRC as the pinnacle of rallying. They're tech savvy, they're early adopters, and 74% of the fan base lived in Europe. Now, what does that mean regarding interaction? 53% preferred watching the action online. So two years ago, this is the World Rally Championship that's going through its own commercial issues. It's now been taken over by Red Bull as, a, as the sports promoter. The TV remains a key touch point for WRC because it doesn't exist anywhere else. Seven in 10 fans aged under the age of 25 follow the WRC on social media. 50% attend one rally event. 50% have purchased WRC merchandise. That's the key one. 78% would like to see more live event coverage and 89% would watch live coverage online. So what, what is, what is the, the, the basis of what it is that I'm talking about here? I fundamentally believe that there has already been a mental shift with sports fans when it comes down to digital content online. They demand constant engagement. This, this, isn't, this isn't about you know, uh, loyalty, as it were. We're not looking to essentially develop loyalty. We're, we're looking to develop habit. Uh, and that's something that people watch match of the day on a, on, on a Saturday. But quite frankly, what do they do on a, on, a, on a Sunday morning or on a Monday or on a Tuesday? They're not going to wait around. And again, as an ex-TV guy, this isn't about watching the 10 o'clock news. You don't need to watch the 10 o'clock news anymore. You go to a 24-hour news channel. Or, more importantly, 20% of all news content on the internet is, or 20% of all traffic on the internet on a daily basis is news. Uh, so people are already consuming their content online, digitally. And I think it's actually behoven on us and, and the panelists as well as people in the audience to actually uh, 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 educate and, and really adopt. Uh, the guys that really do it, in my opinion, better than anyone is the MLB guys, MLB.com. Uh, check out what they're doing. They're just blowing everybody away in terms of how they're engaging with their fan base. But to actually underline one of the points, can you actually get a good user experience in London on baseball? No, you can't. I think that's the next step. Uh, to get that user ex experience at, at, at a level where engagement just becomes click play uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and you can essentially you know, charge against it, ultimately. It's all about commerce. And that's me done. Great. Thanks very much, Blake. So we have uh, just about 10 minutes left for some questions. I'd like to start just by asking a, a quick question to uh, Simon Nixon and to Howard. Uh, and it's, it's really just what hasn't worked for you in the past. You've, been, you've both been doing this for a, a long time. What have you tried in the past to, as a, perhaps the technology was a little bit ahead of where it, where it could have been. Something that you've tried that, that you think that it's time will come again. Something that you were too early with the first time around. I, I, don't, think the, I don't think the technology, sorry, I don't think the technology is ahead. I think it's the buy-in at the boardroom and the things that have not worked is mm -hmm. because there was not somebody senior enough in the business, and I am talking at the top level, who truly understood it. So when the money was being spent, and technology tends to require more than one round of spending, <coughs> and you go back and you ask for more, and you test out people's metal and find out if they're really committed, that's when things have failed, in my experience, not just at Aqueduct in the past. So we're increasingly trying to educate directors of businesses mm -hmm. when we pitch about what they're getting into. It's a big story when they go and pitch. I think the slightly different take on that question was one thing we found that because sport is so ephemeral, you know, the basically the, the highlights from yesterday's match, they're, they're kind of good for the next day and then unless something really, really exceptional happens, it doesn't have much value. So we never had that much success with pay-per-view on VOD. Um, we have huge success on advertising funded VOD uh, by actually getting people to pay for a match that happened a few days ago and especially trying to get them to pay for something that happened a few years ago. Uh, we've never had any success with that. Great, thank you. Any questions from the audience?
Um, with us in uh, Opta, it's kind of different levels of adoption in different territories of the stuff that we talk about, really. Ten years ago, when Opta was doing its stuff, it was very, very niche, and people used to accuse us of trying to Americanize football, um, and people weren't really into it. Now, the, the, the stuff that we do, the stuff that I showed you there, is pretty standard for any football fan in the UK to be into, but that's just simply not the same in different territories across Europe, really. France are pretty good, Italy are coming up behind, Germany are okay, but um, that's one of the major frustrations that I have in that the fans need to be into it for the broadcasters to do it, and then, then you kind of get that circle or the second stream producers, and it's just taking a bit more time than we would like, really. Yeah, I don't mind sort of adding to that. <laughs> Something Simon mentioned in terms of education is, is we found to be critical. Um, another thing is that there are plenty of sports out there and traditional television models uh, and sort of the, uh, the agencies, the sports, uh, sports rights agencies, obviously they focus on the bigger sports. Uh, and so what we found to be quite uh, uh, certainly, you know, I wouldn't say innovative, but lucrative, is, is having conversations with sports who have large fan bases but uh, are not being engaged by traditional broadcasters. Uh, but, but for, for whatever re reasons in terms of the models, you know, to do with education of, you know, the people running the actual sport itself. But we're finding, for instance, that, you know, certainly outside of Europe, uh, um, that, uh, you know, you've got sports that are engaging digitally online and, and, and they have a fertile market, uh, uh, you know, online. So one of the things that we found to be uh, uh, very uh, useful is to engage with those, um, those particular sports themselves. Um, there are enlightened sports agencies that are seeing all of this. They don't want to cannibalize their broadcast revenues by sort of, you know, well, this whole digital market, what's going on here? But there are sports that have just been starved of that broadcast revenue, that broadcast dollar, who are embracing digital uh, whole, wholeheartedly. Yeah, I just wanted to say that that's ex that was exactly what has made Perform mm -hmm. successful, is by... Um, you know, sport is run by broadcasters. Broadcasters pay huge money, and that's what pays all the players' wages and all that kind of thing. They don't really want to mess with that too much because it's great entertainment. But what's left over after the broadcasters have had their piece, that's really where the opportunities are. And that's exactly what Perform has done, is mm -hmm. take those rights. So the Polish league outside of Poland, you know, there's, turns out people like to bet on that stuff. So um, there, there, there is a huge opportunity there. Mm. That didn't really answer the question. That's not frustration, that's more... Well, I find it frustrating. And one thing I will say about the IPL, the Indian Premier League, is that there's a little-known organisation called Willow TV in North America, very, very smart Indian businessman, if I say so myself, uh, who, 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 who carved out the online rights to the IPL in North America. I guess he's sitting with a couple of million dollars a month on that one, right? You know, it's, that's what's going on. Big exp expat print community in North America, and all of that's not, traditional broadcasters have gone, IPL, what are you talking about? That's insane. Cheerleaders with cricket, that'll never work. Uh, 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 guess what? It works, and it works extremely well, and Willow TV are making a fortune as a result. Simon, a quick question for you. Do you see any role in crowdsourcing data? Obviously, you produce data, you've got a fantastic network of people who produce the data. Do you see a role for eliciting data points from your viewers? The problem with that is consistency of definition. Um, you can speak to three or four different data companies and we'll argue what a pass is. Right. So, and is a cross a pass? <laughs> is a corner a cross? And is that a pass? <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that kind of thing, not, it, wouldn't really, it wouldn't really happen to the level that we'd want. Because we work with the professional game and we're, we're helping big clubs buy big players for millions of pounds. They have to know that the data they're looking at is, is consistent. So it's never really been something, I'm sure we've looked at it, but it's never really something that flies. Okay. Any uh, gentleman at the front? Uh, I'm Mark Hickett uh, from Streamwise. I had a question around uh, online engagement, and you mentioned the, the infotainment. So if we look at, uh, at the, the, uh, the mainstream sports, and you said a lot of them are basically owned by the broadcasters, do you think that the um, that online production and, and something that the online companies are driving forward because it doesn't seem like the sports governing body or the broadcasters necessarily are and that's the kind of uh, technology that would provide a lot more data points that presumably allow, would allow you then to position the presentation and the engagement for the audience even better. 
Yeah, it's a good point. Um, one of the, I, thi I think, I'm speculating, one of the key reasons that the Premier League chose Hawkeye is that it creates a graphic, of, and that's essentially another data point that the, the broadcasters can use. Yeah, any, anything that's available like that will be used for entertainment and engagement purposes. The next thing is probably wearable text or something, um, some evolution of the Adidas MyCoach stuff, which is a, a chip in a boot, that kind of thing, and then social elements coming come off that. So, yeah, any, any kind of data points that new technology within the sport produce will go from kind of making the game work to that kind of engagement al angle. Everybody, it's so mainstream now that everybody will be looking at that, certainly. The, the, the obviously, the, the most... Um, what I'm looking for here, the most immediate form of where metadata, which mm. is what we're talking about here in video, creates revenue is what, what we do, sportsmen over there, is um, that is put the odds. Mm. That's, that is the <coughs> ultimate form of user engagement. Yeah, the ultimate engagement, I was going yeah. to ask you. And, and odds is just another form of metadata to wrap around the video, but it's the most compelling and engaging sort of online experience you can get, really. And together with the odds, you can also engage the big data sets that we have to produce kind of... Um, predictive metrics or that kind of thing. So if Wayne Rooney scores first, our database will know that, I don't know, five times, if he scored five times first against Norwich, he, he always scores two in that game or whatever. And you can, you can have these kind of engaging stats that then combine with live odds, that then combine with the, either your second screen application or your broadcast to kind of tie everything together really. So you, you've got a betting point, you've got something to help people make the mind up and then you've got the odds that drive them to the probably to the third party site or to bet within the application I, I think that if if that context is not applied to data and stats it's bordering on meaningless for me i think it's not enough to just simply see the raw stats of the thing that you're already looking at or you're aware of it has to have that level of context and meaning and that's the challenge of datatainment and then making it appeal to everybody in the family. Like my little photo there. You know, my, w my wife might watch the sport with us, but she's not going to be interested in that, so which bit will she be interested in? Mm -hmm. and that was always a premise of datatainment from Richard, which is make it appeal to shallow end fans, something I've never forgotten. Because you also may not want to bet on it. Correct. Yeah. Well, sure, of course, everybody is. Yeah. Yeah. One of the points that we always talk about is that the nerds are a captive audience for us. Yeah. There you go. We've, 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 you know, those guys are bought in. So the challenge for us is to package data to give it that context, to give it that visualisation that, that gives it a more mainstream appeal and makes people interested in stats when they don't even think that they are. Yeah. One last question I think we've got time for. Jeff in the back. Well, as I was saying to Simon earlier, because people have asked me about this today, uh, those kind of things are, are massively above my pay grade. So <laughs> you'll probably find out at the same time that I do. Um, <laughs> suffice to have been really nice to Howard today. Um, but <laughs> 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 I think just more, really. You know, more leagues, more competitions, more sports. We have a certain DNA of what we do at Opta, and that's to give things that context and to give things that insight. And... and Perform seems to have a, have a, have a breadth. So. There's, a, there's an enormous, within sports as a niche, it's, with sports as a market, but within it, there's so many different ways of appealing to sports fans. Which within our stable of, of products, we've got products like Goal.com, which is like, get the news out there first. Uh, then we've got Sporting News, where it's like massive in-depth. Is it best to have a linebacker on a rainy Wednesday? You know, hundreds of words on this sort of stuff. Then we've got Football Zone in Holland, where they'll just say any old salacious nonsense just in order to get a conversation going. And so there's just so many different ways of putting stuff in, but what we can't get away from is what we need is insight and credibility, uh, and uh, your data derives a lot of that insight that sports fans are looking for. Great. We're out of time, so uh, please join me in thanking the panel. So I got a little plug. So... Um, performed annually do a sports media consumption report and my marketing guys told me to bring some along. So if anybody wants one of these, they're full of interesting nuggets about what we've been talking about today. Very good. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent.